Actually, before I do that, I want to go back to where Nick was reading in Malachi. Thank you, Nick and Reuben, for sharing. I was really blessed. I love that you both share from your heart and sincerely and just spoke to my heart. Thanks. In Malachi 4, you know, he talks about that, those beautiful verses where the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings in verse 2. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. And Nick's right. This is that day. Uh, that we're living in the times of preparation for Jesus Christ's re return. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I com commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. And then listen to this. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So there's two days that you read about there. One is the day, verse 3, which I am preparing, which is now. Now that the Holy Spirit has come, Jesus has come. The Holy Spirit is, and he went back up to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit, the, the third person of the Trinity. And now we're living in those days where the Holy Spirit is moving in our midst, wants to fill, fill all of us. And that's one day, that's the day we're living in. But then there's a great and terrible day of the Lord that's coming. And in preparation of that, that's the day of judgment when God will judge. And it's interesting, that ties in with the message that I have to share on my heart this morning. But that great and terrible day of the Lord when Jesus Christ returns and will judge the living and the dead, those who are still alive on this earth and those who died in past times. Uh, and uh, he's going to come and judge. It's going to be a great and terrible day for many people. For those of us who are living the reality of verses 2 and 3, it will be a day of excitement. We read in 1 Thessalonians 3 how the, in a twinkle of an eye, the fly, lightning will flash from one end of the sky to the other and the, the Son of God will, will descend. And uh, first the dead in Christ will rise and then we who remain will be caught up with them. It's going to be exciting. But it's going to be a terrible day for those who rejected Jesus Christ. Who rejected Jesus Christ as God, first of all, and re rejected the salvation and forgiveness of sins uh, and complete salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. The whole world, everybody on this world that has rejected Jesus Christ is going to get the biggest shock of their life. It's going to be a great and terrible day. In preparation of that day, he talks about sending Elijah the prophet. And uh, Elijah is very interesting. I want, to, I want you to turn back to 1 Kings chapter uh, 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah was a prophet who, although there were others in Israel, it says that there were 7,000, I think 7,000, right? Who hadn't bowed the knee to Baal, it says. They served God in secret. They, they were very private about their faith. They, didn't, they weren't very public about it. They were very secret about it. They secretly just said, okay, we're not going to bow to Baal. And there are many Christians that are trying to live those kinds of hidden Christ follower life. There's no such thing. Jesus is looking for disciples and followers who are unashamed to identify themselves as followers of Jesus. Because Jesus said, if you are ashamed to be, be mine, to be associated with me, I will be ashamed of you. My Father will be ashamed of you. So there were those people who were ashamed, 7,000 secret ones. Remember, God told Elijah that. You think you're the only one, but there were 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. However, those 7,000 people who didn't bow the knee to Baal were completely ineffective in leading the people of Israel back to God. They were their secret disciples. They read their Bible quietly and they, they have their own little private devotion. But nobody in the community around them knew that they weren't Baal worshippers because they were afraid, maybe afraid of persecution from Ahab, afraid of what people will think. Oh, you're one of those Jehovah followers? Man, Baal is the cool thing now. And they were afraid, they were ashamed. But Elijah was not. And that's why Elijah is a picture for us of this preparation for the great and terrible day of the Lord that is coming. In the Old Testament, there were single men like that, single prophets like Jeremiah, lone voices, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, uh, lone voices who drew Israel and all those major and minor prophets that you read about. They were single men who called people back to repentance, and Elijah was one of the foremost of them. In fact, when God picked two people to come on the Mount of Transfiguration, he picked Moses, who brought the law, and Elijah, who represented this drawing back of people to God. So Elijah was a man of God, but 
he alone was effective in being an influence in the land of Israel. So much so that, yes, Ahab and Jezebel tried to persecute him, tried to kill him, and sometimes he was afraid. He ran for his life and hid on a few occasions that we read. But he is used as an example. You know, it says in James 5 that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much, and he, he hearkens back to Elijah as an example. So Elijah is an example, and like I was saying, in the Old Testament there were single men, lone prophets. There's no such thing now. Now it's the church. The church is called to be on this earth with the same spirit of Elijah. The spirit that Elijah had, we as a church, not just this church, but the church, the, the body of Christ on this earth today, represented by local expressions of the body of Christ such as this. And our calling, when we say we are part of the church, we're building a local church, what is it that we're really saying we're trying to do? We're trying to be to this community of Loveland, to this area of northern Colorado, wherever you live, the town you live in, the workplace you are placed in. You're trying to be there what Elijah was to Israel in drawing the people of God back to him and being a witness. So that means more than just being a popular, hip, cool guy who's also a Christian on Sunday, and nobody knows that I'm a radical disciple inside. True radical discipleship will manifest itself outside. Now, you can take that to an extreme, a human extreme, where you're hitting people over the head and condemning people and, and you're judging them and always you know, hitting them over the head with Scripture and pronouncing condemnation over them. That's not what God calls us to do. But He says, like we, another one that it, it says, always, you know, think about always, always be ready to give a defense of your hope. Always be ready. Now, they, which means if you sense an opportunity, you're like a, a spy in this, in this community, in this world that you live in, looking for an opportunity to plant a seed of the hope that is in you. It's not enough that we have a hope and we rejoice in it and we thank God for His hope, for the hope He has placed in our heart. It's important that we give a defense of it so that I, I'm sitting, maybe sitting on the train or uh, you know, in the grocery store and... I'm looking for an opportunity. Can I talk to somebody about my hope? I don't, you know, I think you can do this in two ways. You can try to get them to, you know, say a prayer, what they call the sinner's prayer. Say it right now and try to twist their arm into doing it. Don't, don't buy into all that. That's, that's, that's false evangelism. But true evangelism that Peter talks about is where I'm ready, in season and out of season, whether I feel like it or not, whether I'm having a bad day or not, there is a hope within me. Whether I'm feeling tired, whether I'm feeling worn out, there is a hope within me that cannot be shaken, that shines like a light, and people around me ought to be able to see it. And they ought to be able to say, man, I just heard that you went through that amazing, that, that intense trial, and you just have such peace. What do you have? Pray that God will send such people into our lives where they observe our lives and they wonder why is it that we are able to live in a way that transcends the cares and the worries of this world. This is the hope of the gospel. 1 Kings chapter 17, we read about Elijah and this, I just want to mention FYI, is the first verse the Lord gave me this year. January 1st, I was just reading in 1 Kings 17, and I felt the Lord giving me this verse for this year as a verse I want to live by. What characterized Elijah? Why was it that he was able to live in a way that influenced the community? He wasn't afraid to confront 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah and kill 450 of the Baal prophets on Mount Carmel, even though he was one. He brought all of Israel, and he wasn't afraid of being shown up. You know, even though the majority of people, in fact, he was in a very, very, very small minority. If you take all of Israel and you take 7,000 plus Elijah, that's 7,001. I don't even know what the population of Israel was at that time, but it was certainly a minority. And it, Elijah wasn't afraid to be in the minority and yet confront the majority that, that were compromisers who waffled between God, Jehovah, and Baal. And Baal today is a picture, I think, of, of money, mammon. Because God said, you know, in, in that story in uh, 1 Kings 18, you read about, He says to the people, how long will you waffle between Jehovah and Baal? If, if Jehovah is God, serve Him. If Baal is God, serve Him. Don't go this halfway mentality. And the message for us today is, you cannot serve God and mammon. 
Don't waffle between, okay, I serve God, but I'm also interested in making a lot of money and making a name for myself and glorifying myself and promoting myself, whether it's in Christian ministry or in my workplace. Work as hard as you can. Move up the ladder as much as God allows you to, but don't be taken up with these things. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that's the message that we, the church, as the Elijah of today, must be proclaiming. Must be proclaiming. But this is the verse that the Lord gave me. 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. If that resonates with you, take that verse as a, as a motto for your year 2016 and for the rest of your life. As the Lord God lives before whom I stand. Which means that we're going to face situations on this earth, whether it's persecution, whether it's mocking, the reproach of Christ, whether it's the temptation to please others, to worry about the opinions of men and women, whether it's in our workplace or even in the church. And in the midst of that, instead of worrying about what people think of us, let us proclaim that as the Lord God lives before whom I stand, He is the only one before whom I stand. And when people see us standing before the Lord God who lives, they will realize, I mean, what that will translate into is that they will try to influence you, to come with them and compromise with them. Christian friends of yours will try to com get you to compromise and say, what's so bad about that? Do you really have to be that radical? And Elijah took a firm stand. Uh, as the Lord God lives before whom I stand. And I think about that. I'll tell you honestly, church, the way... The Lord spoke that to me when I get up here and preach, when we interact with you, when we counsel you, when we try to walk with you and uh, pour our hearts out into your lives as elders. We do it with this. We're not here to please you or to win a popularity contest or even to be affected by your assessment of whether you think we're good elders or not. We stand before Almighty God. We have to answer to Him, not to any man. And more and more, I'm trying to do that. I don't think I've done that perfectly in the past. Our flesh is such that we are influenced by what people think of us. We're influenced by the popularity vote. We're influenced by whether people think I'm doing a good job or not. That's the world we live in. However, if you want to be an Elijah, live by this verse, as the Lord God lives before whom I stand. I stand before Him. And I, it doesn't mean that I, uh, that I live carelessly. It doesn't mean that I can be brash or rude to others because that's an extreme. That means that I'm really not standing before God. But when I stand before God, the Lord God who lives, before whom I stand, I get a recognition of His holiness and His purity, and I get a recognition of His being my Father. And it brings security into my life that my Father looks down on me with love and adoration, and I'm the apple of His eye. What does it matter what people think of me? What does it matter if people have this to say about you or that to say about you? When it is the Lord God, your Father now, which they couldn't say in the Old Testament, before whom you stand. Are you standing before the Lord God of Israel who lives? The Lord God who lives, are you standing before your heavenly Father who is alive in the heavenlies and recognizing that everything is naked and bare before Him? That's Hebrews 4. Everything is naked and bare before the God with whom we have to do. You know that phrase? That phrase is a very powerful phrase. Everything is naked and bare with the God before the God with whom we have to do. That means there is only one with whom you have to do. Your dealings are not with people on this earth, family. Your dealings are not with the authorities of this world and not even with the spiritual forces of darkness. Yes, we wrestle against them. But our, whom we have to do with is our God. Everything is naked and bare before Him. And when we see that, and He's my Father, He sees everything naked and bare. And then He sees my faults. He sees the mistakes I made. He has the blood of Jesus Christ available to forgive me for those things. And he says, forgiveness is rich. My mercies to you are new this morning in a way that they've, I've never shown you mercies yet. This is the God who lives before whom I stand, whose mercies are new every morning, who is my Father, who's singing the Father's song over me. And I just, you know, I don't want to make it sound like I get warm, cozy, or anything like that, but in a sense I do. It's just, it just joy, rejoices my heart. And bring stability and security into my life. Now let man say what they will about us or about you. Let people reproach you and scorn you or think nothing of you. Everything is naked and bare before the God before, with whom we have to do. Live before His face. Make that your goal in 2016. 
In Matthew chapter 8, in order to do that, I say that by way of preface, because in order to do that, in order to have that, we must have a clear conscience before God and with man. We cannot have that relationship with God you know, as the Lord God lives before whom he st we stand, when we recognize that everything is naked and bare with the God, before the God with whom we have to do, we recognize that if I'm holding on to anything in my heart, if there is a guilty conscience in my relationship with God, first of all, but also in my relationship with anybody on this earth, if there's something that I haven't set right, then I cannot say, as the Lord God lives before whom I stand. Because God says, you cannot stand before me. You have that sin that I'm trying to convict you about through your conscience that you're refusing to deal with. You have that matter that needs to be set right with that person you've hurt that I'm convicting you about that you haven't dealt with. And then we can say that, well, everything is naked and bare. Yes, everything is naked and bare. And God sees that I have that hidden sin or I've swept something under the carpet. So our responsibility is to bring everything in the light. Now, the beautiful thing is, that when we bring it into the light, there is richness of mercy. There's richness of love and compassion and in the presence of God. In Matthew chapter 8, we'll begin reading in verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountain, a large crowds were following him. This is right after what we've been studying in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 2, And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, we're going to, I'm going to talk about leprosy and not physical leprosy. We don't see that here much. If you go to some other parts of the world, you'll see it. It's common in parts of India. I grew up seeing lepers who were beggars, homeless on the street, because they were kind of like that outcast. So you don't see it here that much. But leprosy is a very devastating disease. But before we talk about leprosy, if we, yeah, on that next slide, I want to talk about pain. We may not realize how precious and how much of a gift pain is to us in our physical bodies. You know, every time you're in pain, you, you stub your toe, something like that. I was like, oh, why does it have to hurt? It's just a little toe. And there's so much pain. You know, the reason for that is there's so many uh, nerve endings concentrated there at the tip of your toe. That that's why you feel that intensity of pain. It's multiplied. So, but pain is a blessing. Because if it wasn't for pain, you wouldn't know that something had gotten into your body that was going to harm you that could ultimately kill you. So if you, got a if you were walking and you got a nail through your foot, or you're out there roofing and you shot a nail through your foot, if you didn't have pain, you wouldn't know. You just go on your life and keep going, and maybe months later this little nail is in your foot and it's not hurting, and it just gets infected and the uh, uh, infection spreads to the rest of the body. Ultimately, that could kill you. So pain is a blessing. You know, they talk about pain is a blessing in disguise. Yes, it is. It feels hurtful to have pain. Uh, when we, you know, when we have pain, it's not pleasant, but it is a blessing in disguise because without that pain, we would go through life hurting ourselves, doing more permanent physical damage to our bodies uh, than with a simple thing like a nail being going through your foot. That's, that, that's a, a rectifiable situation. If you got a nail through your foot, you can rectify that. You go to a doctor, go to the emergency room, they can get it out. But if you don't even know that it's there and then that infection spreads through your foot into the rest of your body, and ultimately to your heart or to your brain, then there's, it's too late. It could kill you. And um, I want to talk about how pain is for us. Is, I, I picture pain. For me, pain is to the body what our conscience and the pricking of our conscience is to our spirit and our soul. And in the same way that God has allowed pain to be in our bodies, to remind us and to tell us, hey, there's something not right here. You've got a nail in your foot. That's not right. It's not supposed to be there. In the same way God has given us consciences that he pricks through the what's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In John 16, talks about he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is conviction. Conviction is that pain in the conscience, that little prick that says, hey, there's a nail in here. The way you spoke to your wife, that wasn't right. And this nail is there. Now, how long are you going to wait before you set it right? How long would you wait before you took the nail out of your foot? 
I mean, are you, are you happy to just walk around with a limp and say, man, I got a nail in my foot and I'm just walking around like that? Do we see, church, do we see, friends, that when we walk around with a guilty conscience, whether it's before God or before men, whether, uh, and we'll talk about some of those things that cause guilty consciences. It's like that. It's like I have this nail in my foot and I'm walking around with a limp and God wants me to run, wants me to fly, but I can barely walk because I've got this limp. And the solution is very simple. We'll talk about the solution in a moment. But uh, essentially to say this, that just like pain, God has allowed in our body to show us and to remind us, hey, something's not right. He's given us a conscience. And so, dear friend, if you're, if you're born again, and even if you're not born again, Every person, every human being has a conscience. You can read about that, Romans 1 and 2. He talks about even the ones who don't acknowledge Jesus. Their consciences within them convict them or judge them. They, they tell them, man, that's not right. So even the people in the world who are doing wrong things, they have something within them that tells them, you know, you stole that. There's something not right. And, you know, it begins when we're children. But the root of all sin is selfishness, like I have on there. It's selfishness, which means I'm always thinking about what's going to please me. Uh, or having it my own way. What can I do to please myself in this situation? That's the root of all sin. It's that selfishness. And our conscience warns us every time I do something that pleases myself, or I say that word, or uh, do that action, or you know, think of myself and think of pleasing myself and having it my way, my conscience within me pricks me and says, you shouldn't have done that. God has called us as his children to follow the example of Jesus about whom it says, keep a finger in Matthew 8, I'll come back to it. Romans 15, let me show you this verse. One of the characteristics, one line characteristics of Jesus' life on this earth, which must be a one line characteristic of our life as well, if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, is what it says here in Romans 15, verse 3. Even Christ did not please himself. Even Christ did not please himself. Six words, easy to remember. Even Christ did not please himself. Imagine, dear friends, dear brothers and sisters and family, if we went through this year, 2016, where I set it as my goal so that by the end of 2016, God would be able to write about me, who calls myself a follower of the same Jesus. Even Santosh did not please himself in 2016. Do you believe it's possible? I hope you do, because otherwise we're fooling ourselves to call ourselves Christians. We're fooling ourselves and saying, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus never pleased himself but me. Oh, I live to please myself. If it feels good, I'm going to do it. If, it. if it'll make me, uh, you know, if it'll push me up in the estimation of others, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to say and conduct myself in a way that's self-promoting. And God gives us this conscience that reminds us, this prick that says, hey, Something's not right. You pleased yourself in that situation. You spoke that word to your husband or to your wife out of self-defense, out of wanting to please this you, this ego inside that was hurt. And so you retorted with that, ah, I, but you think you accuse me of doing that? Well, what about you? This is that self-defense mentality that comes out of pleasing myself. And God has given us the conscience. I hope if you speak disrespectfully or speak rudely or, or treat other people harshly, that there is that conscience within you. What saddens me is that there are Christians who are not convicted at all. And they can go on with their lives treating other people badly, being disrespectful, being rude, stealing, uh, lusting with their eyes, anger, uh, ang acting out in anger in their home life. Now in front of everybody else, of course, they have the reputation that all is good. But at home, it's a completely different story. And... Um, you know, the, if you look at, for example, the difference between the conscience in a child and the conscience in an adult, take a little child, a very, very little child. If you've ever seen a, like a two or three year old lie, you know what I'm talking about. You know, they, they lie, but they, they can't maintain eye contact and it's very difficult for them to lie with a straight face because they know they're lying. Their conscience is so sensitive. Because they're born with, that, born with that sensitive conscience. And as children, it's, even though that propensity to sin is in them, because we're born in sinful flesh until we're born again, then we're born off the spirit. But we're born in the flesh. And so you look at a child that's two, three years old, and they tell you a lie. Did you, Johnny, did you eat the cookie? I'm glad there's no Johnnies in our church, because I can use that as a, as a general name. <laughs> Johnny, did you eat the cookie? No, nope. but of course there's crumbs on his face, and he's trying to look like he didn't do it. It's hard for little children to, to lie because their conscience is searing them. It's like they're being convicted. What is it when a child does something wrong and then lies about it? What is it in them that causes them to just be fidgety and they can't lie? Because it's their conscience. 
And that's why Jesus said, unless you become like little children, and this was one of those things he was talking about, unless you become little children in your sensitivity of conscience, where you do something and you're telling a lie, you're being hypocritical, but you can't fool people because your conscience is so sensitive. You say a harsh word to your wife or your husband, but immediately you're convicted and you just so run back to your wife, your husband, say, I'm so sorry, I don't know why I slipped up in that area and, and sinned. Please forgive me. This is a sensitive conscience. So, but as we, as we grow up and become adults, we, our, our, our consciences get desensitized, where people can get up in court, put their hand on the Bible and swear an oath and still lie. It goes on in courts all the time. I mean, just, just, just flat lies. I've had people lie to me like that, where I even try to remind them and say, I want to ask you a question in the presence of God who is listening to this conversation about a certain matter, lied to me. No fear of God at all. And this happens in the world, but the result, the reason it's like that is because the consciences have been desensitized. Every time the Holy Spirit pricks your conscience and you shut him out, when you grieve the Holy Spirit, you quench the Holy Spirit, like he says in 1 Thessalonians 5. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do you know what it means to quench the Holy Spirit? That means the Holy Spirit is like a fire, sear, you know, uh, uh, trying to burn your conscience, trying to get you to realize what you're doing is wrong. The path you're headed in is wrong. It's sinful. It's ungodly. It will lead you into destruction and death. And he's pricking at it, but you say, no, pour water on that fire. Pour water on that flame. When you quench the Holy Spirit, here's the interesting thing. He will allow himself to be quenched. Otherwise, we don't need an exhortation like, do not quench the Holy Spirit, which means it is possible to quench the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit being the gentleman that he is, if he's trying to, but now he loves you. God loves you. He's your father. He wants you to have the best life possible. He wants you to be set free from that leprosy, that causes you to not feel this pain, and he's, uh, he, he loves you. But if you quench him, he will back off, and then he'll back off a little bit more. And you, if you go on year after year after year, quenching the Holy Spirit, shutting out that prick of the Holy Spirit, one day the time will come where you can do horrible, horrible sins and think nothing of it. You think about how Christians who, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day about how you, 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 when you hear about Christians that fall into adultery, sexual sin, sexual immorality or adultery. It didn't start there. It wasn't like, oh man, I was in a you know, wrong place at the wrong time, fell into adultery. No, it starts with lust. It starts with being unfaithful in the area of our eyes and, and lusting with our eyes and not taking it seriously. And the Holy Spirit is convicting you because you have knowledge of the Word and because you come to this church where we preach what Jesus preached, that lusting with your eyes will send you to hell. You don't find many churches preaching that. But that said, as the Holy Spirit convicts you and says, don't you know this will harm you? This will hurt you. This will destroy your life. It says, ah, oh, Holy Spirit, just be quiet. I just, yeah, what's so bad about it? Every Christian in the world is doing that. That can't be that bad. Okay. Next thing you know, you're addicted to pornography. And it leads into that. And you're thinking, what's so bad? And the whole time, Christians, you know, the Holy Spirit's trying to convict you and saying, don't you know this is right? Can't you, don't you know you cannot set, set any ungodly thing before your eye? And then eventually it leads into Outward sin, and that, uh, adultery. It doesn't start there, but it starts with this, oh, I think lusting is okay. Now, I may not, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those do not co uh, commit adultery types, but I tolerate a little bit of lust. Eventually, as the Holy Spirit pricks my conscience about lust, right now, when He pricks me about adultery, I, I pay heed to it and say, yeah, I'm not never going to commit adultery. But when He pricks my conscience about lust, I don't take it that seriously. And eventually, that prick, that uh, that uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to get more and more in uh, my heart, my conscience is going to become more insensitive to it so that now I'm committing all kinds of gross sins without even feeling a little bit of a prick of conscience. Now apply that same to any area, whether it's anger. People don't start with murdering people. It starts with anger that's not dealt with in the heart. People don't start with doing horrible, horrible things outwardly. It starts with a little bit of compromise, a little bit of telling lies, a little bit of hypocrisy. And the result is, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, in 1 Timothy 4, in verses 1 and 2, he talks about Christians who fell away. Christians who fit into this description of exactly what I was just talking about, where they used to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, but they quench the Holy Spirit, quench the Holy Spirit, quench the Holy Spirit. Finally, look what happens. The Spirit explicitly says, this is 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, that in later times some will fall away 
from the faith. In order to fall away from the faith, you had to have had the faith to begin with. Very simple. Beats, you know, just blows out of the water all the eternal security, predestination theology that's around in Christendom today. The Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. You mean I as a Christian who had faith at one point am in danger of paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons? Where a demon will speak to me and preach me something, maybe through another human being, read me something from the Bible or say something to me and I will believe it. I will believe the lie. This deceitful spirit and this doctrine of demons. You know demons have doctrines. It's very clear in this verse. There are doctrines of demons and people are falling for them and falling away from the faith as a result of them. Why is that happen? Why is it that people will fall away from the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons because, verse 2, of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. So that's what he talks about where a hypocrisy sets in, where the Holy Spirit's convicting you what you're doing there is not right. You're getting on the computer, you're doing that, you know, that's not right. Or you're talking to that person that way. You're, you're carrying on a flirtatious um, conversation or with that person at work and, and, and it's just, it's not right. But the more I reject the voice of the Holy Spirit and the more I, I, I tell him, Holy Spirit, leave me alone. I just want to enjoy this. I want to please myself. Can't I please myself for a little bit? And the Holy Spirit says, okay, you want to please yourself? Sure. I'll, I'll withdraw. And the result of that is this hypocrisy of liars uh, this hypocrisy of liars leads them into searing their own conscience as with a branding iron. It's like taking a branding iron and putting it on flesh. I was out there with Cliff some years ago branding some of his cattle and you know you, you see what happens when they brand it. They put it on this flesh. What happens I think and the way I understand this verse is when you brand that flesh the, the nerve endings at that, at that point of the flesh are killed and now they can't feel anything right there. Maybe that's what that means. But that's exactly what happens to our conscience where the more I resist the, the voice of the Holy Spirit, the more I reject and I quench His conviction of me, He's, what's happening, what I'm doing to myself and what I don't realize is that I'm branding myself. I'm searing my conscience in a way that that area of my conscience becomes dead. In the same way that leprosy affects parts of our body. You know, if you see lepers, for example, very common to see this in India, lepers will have nubs for their fingers. They won't have whole fingers. They'll just have little nubs. It looks like that. That's all they'll have with their fingers. Why? Because uh, the uh, infection sets in, in here, and it, it just causes their fingers to just fall off, to break off. Why? Because there's there's no sense of pain there. They've lost that. Lep leprosy affects the nerve endings and results in my body not feeling any pain. And the result is, you know, maybe I, I got it hurt or I bent it. And my, if I had pain, I would immediately know, wow, it's hurt. I need to go see a doctor. But because I have leprosy, because I have this lack of sensation in my finger, I, I don't even know that I, my bone is just broken. And there's infection inside. And a nail is in there. And it's just spreading to the whole body. And eventually, the finger just falls off. They have, you just see little nubs. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know if this was just an old wife's tale, or, but they, I was told that, like, um, animals will come, like, they sleep, you know, out in the gutters and stuff like that, and animals will come and just buy, nibble at their fingers, and they wouldn't even know it. And that's somehow, somehow how, uh, that, you know, their fingers just dwindle. They don't have sensation in their fingers. But applying that to our Christian life and to our consciences, when we realize that every time we reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when He's putting, He's pricking our conscience, He's saying, pay attention to that. Go back and set that right. Go back and apologize. Go back and set that matter right. Go back and set that matter right. Every time I say, well, no, let me think of a good day when I feel good. It's not the right time. But they did this to me, all these other things. What I'm doing is I'm searing my conscience, deadening the flesh in a way that now when the Holy Spirit taps on that same spot, I'm not even feeling it. And that's what happens here is that now the, do the doctrines of demons come in. The only thing that will protect us from doctrines of demons and deceitful spirits is if the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Where I'm hearing the Holy Spirit vo Spirit's voice and I recognize this is the voice of the Holy Spirit, that's the voice of a demon. But if I become deafened and dulled and desensitized to the voice of the Holy Spirit, then I believe the doctrine of a demon holding a Bible, standing there as an angel of light and think this is the truth. And you see that happening in Christendom, all over Christendom. He goes on to say, I mean, he says earlier in 1 Timothy 1, verse 19, that when you don't preserve faith and a good conscience, 
you see often Paul talk about keep a good conscience, keep a good conscience. Make sure that if there's anything that you need to set right, do it right away at the earliest opportunity. Don't put it off. Let's make 2016, church family, a year where we don't put off these things that the Holy Spirit convicts us about and set it right immediately. 1 Timothy 1 verse 19, if you don't keep faith and a good conscience, you will, uh, and you reject it, you know, reject this good conscience. That's what it, it's the same thing. Quenching the Holy Spirit, rejecting the good conscience, rejecting the voice of the Holy Spirit, they suffer shipwreck. That's, that's like saying the whole body got infected with leprosy. Leprosy that attacks the nerve endings so that we don't feel pain. Some examples on that next slide, uh, Jake. Some examples of what it means, uh, what, what can give us a guilty conscience. Things like how we speak to or treat others. Anger and lust. I've already talked about that. Obeying the laws of the land. Let me show you this in Romans 15. You may not realize that if you disobey the laws of the land, whether it's in paying your taxes, whether it's in being in subject to all every earthly authority, um, the, that this has to do with conscience. By the way, that's not Romans 15, it's Romans 13. <laughs> Romans 13, look at what he says. And I'll tell you this, we live in a, in a country and at a time when it's very popular for so-called Christians to live in a way that's not in subjection to authorities, to speak evil of authorities and rulers on this land, and to think that it's okay to not live in subjection to them. Now, I'm not talking about um, doing sinful things if, they, if the government asks us to do that, or doing wickedness, but the, verse, the, the command here in Romans 13 is very clear. Listen to it carefully. Romans 13 verse 1. Every person is to be sub, in subjection to the governing authorities. He's not talking about heaven, He's not talking about hell where there are spiritual forces of darkness. He's talking about on this earth. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. Do you know who, the pre who put the president in the White House? God did. Yes, he won the, 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 the vote, but God was the one who put him there as an authority. Do you know who appointed the mayor? Do you know who appointed the governor? God did. Even in wicked lands in the Middle East and all those other countries where people are living sinful lives, we must recognize that there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God, that God is sovereign and He has allowed these ungodly people who even dishonor Him by their lives to be there in authority. So, and he says, irrespective of the fact whether you agree with their policies or disagree with them, whether you think He's good or not, you must live in subjection to Him. Or what? Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists authority and has, op has opposed the ordinance of God. When you resist the authority in the land, you're resisting the ordinance of God. You see that, that that's rebellion against God himself. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For it, that is the authority, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God. <laughs> the next time you got pulled over, you might remember this verse. <laughs> this is a minister of God pulling me over. An avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now listen to what he says in verse 5. Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, because they will punish you if you uh, uh, resist their authority. You will receive the punishment and the wrath of the government, but also for conscience sake. The Holy Spirit will convict you when you have that rebellion and that spirit of unsubmission towards the earthly authorities. Now you could quench it and say, ah, oh, yeah. But he's so ungodly, oh yeah, but he defends gay marriage, or oh yeah, but this and that. Guilty conscience. <coughs> so that's uh, some examples. Turn back a few pages to Romans chapter 2. I wonder how God is going to judge the world, you know, and I don't think we'll ever know while we're on this earth how God is going to judge the world. But I believe that our conscience will be a big part of it. Because he says in Romans chapter 2 that the one who sins without the law will be judged outside of the law, will perish, actually is what he says, outside of the law earlier in uh, um, verse 12, Romans 2 verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law, you know, sometimes people ask what happens to a man who never heard the gospel, 
Never was told about Jesus Christ. How is God going to judge them if, as we believe and as is true, that Jesus Christ is the only way uh, of salvation, that no one comes to the Father through Jesus? How is God going to judge somebody who never heard? He will be judged. All, all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Now, none of us falls into that first category because we've already heard. We've already been told, so let's not even imagine, let's not go down rabbit trails of trying to figure out how God is going to judge somebody else. You and I, because we're sitting here even listening to this message, because God has spoken to us and He's given us consciences that convict us, now we're without excuse. He starts in Romans 2 by saying, you're without excuse, every one of you that judges. Um, then he goes on to say in verse 14, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. They show the effect of the law. These are people who don't know Jesus. They don't know the Bible. They don't know God's Word. They don't know the law of God and the way we're supposed to live. But within their hearts, you see that uh, they show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their consciences, that's why it's very, it, it's true, like I said earlier, a conscience. It's, it's true that every single human being has a conscience. I don't believe animals do, but God has given us a conscience, and that is one aspect of our being made in the image of God is that that conscience tells us you shouldn't be doing this. You're supposed to live, you're supposed to be a child of God and live as a child of God. You're not supposed to be doing this self-pleasing because if all you do is please yourself, you're no better than a dog, no better than an animal. If all you do is think of yourself, that's what dogs do, think of themselves, what, what, what's there to eat? And um, No better than an animal that's just interested in me, me, me. That's animal mentality, but um, this, it talks about those who without the law, their conscience is bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So while they're on this earth, even though they haven't heard the gospel, there's a conscience within them that God is using and he's trying to speak to them and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing that. And... On the day, it says in verse 16, when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So this is the basis on which God will judge through Christ Jesus on that final day. He will say, I gave you a conscience. You knew better, even the ones who were outside of the law. But for those of us who know the law, we will be judged by the much higher standard. To whom much is given. That was that verse in, I think, in Luke 8 that uh, Nick read. To whom much is given, much will be required. And for those of us who listen and, and pay attention and, uh, and, uh, and hear good teaching, the, the standard of our judgment is much higher. Because God will say, I gave you that much light, that much conviction of the Holy Spirit, and yet you quenched. So the one who has quenched the Holy Spirit more than somebody else will receive a greater judgment, will receive a greater damnation. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men, the secrets of men, not judge them based on the outward, but on the secrets. And God will stand every single one, every single human being before him and say, I gave you a conscience, I gave you light, you rejected it, you rejected it, you rejected it. Um, how to be freed from a guilty conscience? The good news is that it's, the work has already been done. It's like Jesus said, you know, this leper in Matthew 8 that we read came to Jesus and says, if you are willing, I can be cleansed, I can be healed. And Jesus said, I am willing. And he healed him, cleansed him completely. Cleansing is the only way that we can be freed from a guilty conscience. The cleansing of our conscience, not sh uh, sweeping it under the carpet, not just ignoring it and just say, okay, let's just put it on the back burner for a while. Cleansing it, where the blood of Jesus Christ comes in and cleanses my conscience completely. He talks about that in Hebrews 9, verse 14. Verse 13, if the blood, Hebrews 9, 13, if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience. He talks about from dead works to serve the living God. Um, and so he's talking not only just about sin, but dead works. That's a work that's not necessarily an evil work, but a work that is, like Nick was talking about, not originating in God. It's a work that I originate, a zeal that I have, or a desire, or a ministry that I'm pursuing. It's not God, it's not me falling on my face and worshiping God and hearing God's voice and receiving from Him unction through the Holy Spirit. 
That's a dead work. It's a, a, de a work that is dead. Why? Because I am a man of death. I was born in the flesh and I will die because I was born of Adam and Eve, who God said, of whom God said, in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. So everything that originates with man is death. And those are all dead works. Remember the distance, there's, there's three types of works. Evil works, which is sin. Dead works, which are works that don't originate with God. Good works that originate with me. And then there's righteous works, good works. So we, we must also have our conscience cleansed from these dead works, which means I, the Holy Spirit says, well, you got up and preached that message, but there was a little bit of honor seeking in it. That's a dead work. You were seeking the approval of men. It wasn't true that you were standing before God with whom you have to do, before whom you stand. You were just worried about what people would think about the message you just preached or what you said. That's a dead work. Or you did that wonderful act and you did that act of hospitality or you did some goodness, you did something to help somebody in the church and you wanted to make sure people saw it. That's a dead work. Living for the approval of men where I want people to give me credit and get some honor or glory from it. I want people to talk about me and what a good person I am. It's a dead work. And let the Holy Spirit convict us and let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse our conscience from these dead works. Um, and there's a beautiful picture in Leviticus chapter 9 that I want to show you of, of how um, the priest or the leper was supposed to get uh, the priest to certify that he is free of leprosy. In Leviticus 9, I'm sorry, Leviticus 14, we'll begin reading in verse 3. Uh, the middle of verse 2, he shall be brought to the priest if uh, the law in the day of his cleansing, when the leper has been cleansed, he shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out to the outside of the camp. Thus the priest shall look and if the infection of leprosy has been healed in the leper, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall also give orders to slay the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water. As for the live birds, so there's two birds, one of them is killed. The two birds representing the one who was killed for our, in order for us to have a clear conscience, and me, the other bird that gets to go free. In order for the live bird to go free, the dead bird had to be killed. I mean, not the dead bird had to be killed. The other bird had to be killed. A dead bird cannot be killed. Um, as for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. This is a beautiful picture. I remember when I read this again a few days ago, I just got this picture of here's, you know, how do they pick the two birds? Here's two birds, identical, two live, live birds, and the priest picks one says, you're going to be the scapegoat. You're going to be the scape bird, as it were. You're going to be the one that's going to be killed. And you, and the, and the one bird, and the, and the bird that's picked to kill, just says, why me? Couldn't you, I mean, what basis is this? Can you do eeny, meeny, miny, mo or something like that? But did you see what happened when Jesus Christ volunteered himself and said, I will be the bird that, that'll be killed. And you, live birds that are here on this earth, you will dip yourself and, and, and that running, in that running water, in my blood, and you will have the opportunity to go free. This is the beauty of how God cleanses us from leprosy, from having that guilty conscience. Thank, I mean, does that just want you to re rejoice in Jesus? That he, he, it wasn't like he waited there for somebody to pick. You know, even if he was sent, it would be one thing, but he volunteered. Yes, the Father sent him. He, the Father gave him, but Jesus did it willingly. He didn't come here reluctantly and says, how come I got to be the, the bird that had to die? How come I got to be the bird that I had to die? And this is the mentality with which we build a church, where I'm willing to be that grain of wheat that falls into the ground and die and say, Lord, thank you for setting me free. Now help me to have this mentality towards others, that I'll serve them and bless them and go underneath them and be willing to... Husbands, this is exactly what the command is given to us in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and became the bird that was to be killed gave himself up for her. Is this how we're living, husbands? Living in a way that we give ourselves up, where if there's something that I can do for my wife and it involves me dying to myself in a deeper way than I've ever died, and I think, why ought my wife to be the one that causes, causes me to die in such a way? You do it gladly, because you see Jesus loved the church that way and gave himself up for her. He said, I'll be the, the bird that will be killed. You go free. 
Raise your hand up, husbands, and say this. Wife, I'll be the bird that d dies. You go free so that you don't have to carry that burden. This is what it means to live with our wives in an understanding way. Read 1 Peter 3. If not, you can come to all the prayer meetings. You can pray for your meal. You can call out to God and sing to Him, and your prayers will not be heard, he says. 1 Peter chapter 3. The beautiful thing is, back in Matthew chapter 8, we read that already. Jesus said, I am willing. Hear the word of Jesus for your 2016 church. Jesus says, I am willing. I am willing to be that dead bird afresh to you so that you can cleanse your guilty conscience. Come, come and allow me to sensitize your conscience through the Holy Spirit. Let me bring it back to life first of all, that part of your conscience that has been seared like a branding iron. Let me come and through the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse it. And when it's cleansed, it comes back to life. That which was dead, that dead flesh, comes back to life and has sensation again. This is what happened when you were born again, didn't it? That you started to feel sensation. All of a sudden, you, you, you heard the Holy Spirit speaking to you about a, a bunch of things that you never thought were sin. May it be true that in 2016, by the end of 2016, there are more areas in our life that we are, where we are sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It says in Mark 1, in the parallel passage, that Jesus told him to be quiet, but he went away proclaiming, I was a leper, I've been set free. Let this be the song that rises up out of RLCF. I used to be a leper. My conscience was so seared and so dead that I did all kinds of things and I hurt so many people and said so many words that were so hurtful, but I'm alive now. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me and I've been set free. Amen. <laughs>